Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome to episode 5 of Everything Possible in Dark Souls 1. And before we get underway, let's go ahead and take a look at our items and our stats. Pretty much the same as we had last time. Go ahead and switch to the Ring of the Evil Eye, since I'm not too concerned about dying right now. And you can see I have the Blooming Purple Moss equipped, and here are my stats. I have leveled up 5 times since we defeated Quaylag. Basically put 1 point in vitality, 2 in strength, 2 in dexterity. We're leveling this character in such a way, not that we're going for a quality build per se, although it sure looks like we are, but I'm trying to keep the character in such a way that I can fairly easily switch to other types of builds throughout the series. At some point we may not want to be such a heavy character using a claymore. Maybe we want to actually use a dagger with the shadow set, or maybe we want to look into some magic. As long as we tend to level up somewhat evenly, then we'll be able to switch with minor issue. Taking the wheel up to the top. Now this can actually be a bit of a tricky spot, so what I like to do is wait till you're about halfway up at the top before you start actually going down, obviously. Go ahead and walk right off and you should be fine. So continue to climb. Take out this giant mosquito here. And this is another area where you really want to have that auto wall recovery off for your camera because walking through here your camera is bound to try to auto correct if you have that option enabled and it can lead you to plunge to your death. But up here we have some interesting items that have some lore behind it. I'm going to try to get into it just a little bit. But this is the Crimson set, also known as the Sealer set. And this is the armor and the catalyst used by the Sealers of New Londo. Now specifically, this corpse is likely the corpse of Yulva, one of the sealers of New Londa who actually left in order to come to Blighttown and try to cure actually some of the inhabitants. And the reason we suspect that is because of this sorcery. This is Yulva's remedy that she actually came to Blighttown with in order to try to help some people out. Sadly, it doesn't look like she made it very far since she only got down a few ladders before meeting her end. Luckily, it does look like she was able to get her sorcery into a chest hoping that someone else might come behind her and finish the job that she had started. Over here, just taking a quick look just to give you some perspective. That was a fog gate before. That was from the entrance into Blighttown. And now, instead of climbing back down and walking across that narrow tree branch, we're going to break these items. And there's a clear spot that it looks like the developers intended us to jump, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Easy peasy. And you probably already noticed that there's plenty of blow darts coming our way, which is why we have that blooming purple moss equipped, and it's also why we're still using the spider shield. The spider shield, as much as I love it, is not going to be a mainstay on this character. As soon as we're done with these toxic areas, we will be switching it out. But you can see it is absolutely vital, in my opinion, in order to not get toxic. So as we've mentioned before, they drop moss clumps. We got a purple moss clump and another blooming purple moss clump from that blow dart sniper. Take out this next one here. Get ourselves another pair of purple moss clumps. And sometimes the snipers will walk off. In this case, one of them already has. I tried to make that jump, and I know I can. I've done it before in practice. Fortunately, it just wasn't in the cards today. But we got another purple moss clump and another blooming purple moss clump. Which is pretty excellent, considering those can be expensive if you're trying to buy them. While we're down here, we'll take out some of these fire dogs. Get ourselves our second firekeeper soul, so now we could upgrade our SS Flask to plus two. If we can find a firekeeper that's still alive to upgrade that. But we'll see more on that in the next episode. Take out this sniper, purple moss clump. Now we have two dogs straight ahead, but also there is an ambush to the left. So peek out, get the attention, and then back up. If you can bait them into using their fire attack, just circle around. Very easy kill. With the dogs dead, we do have one more blow dart sniper to deal with. He is not as clever as his other friends. He is just going to stand in an alcove, and if we get too close, he'll try to run away often. Right into a wall. Let's see how that works out for him. He tries to run. 
and we decide to ram a claymore through his back. So how'd that work out for him? I don't know. I mean, maybe if that's what he was looking for, then it worked exactly as planned. Grab this soul of a proud knight, and now we're going to keep making our way out of Blight Town. I wish I could say for good, but there are a few quests, as I mentioned in the last episode, that will bring us back here. And really, not too long. Quite a few ladders here. We mentioned that soul popping was one of the best improvements that Dark Souls 2 has over Dark Souls 1, and I absolutely agree with that sentiment. One of the others is that you can sprint up ladders. These ladders aren't too bad, however, there is a ladder we're going to see here in just a little bit that is dreadfully long. So we're at the top of Blight Town now. Before we leave, we want to make sure that we loot this chest so we can get the Key to New Londo Ruins. I guess we can probably theorize that Yolva had placed it there for safekeeping while she was in Blighttown. Rest in peace, Yolva. Now we have a few more barbarians to deal with. And I do have a slight correction to make. I had mentioned that the barbarians used the giant club, the one that we picked up earlier when we fought the boulder-wielding barbarians. However, that is actually not the case. They used the large club. Now, sadly, I don't get that. I just get some more of their dung. But on my practice, I did receive the large club a few times from them, so it's not a terribly uncommon drop. I like to pull this first one. Even though the second one will be aggroed, we do get a little bit of leeway as far as getting this one. Sadly, had I had that backstab, I would be in a much better situation right now. But with one down, the other one is not too difficult to take out. Missed the backstab yet again. But this ought to finish it. Hooray, more pie! What a terrible thing to say when the pie is made out of dung. And that's about the last we're going to see of dung pies for a while. That is, until we get into the DLC and we talk to a Mr. Hawkeye Goff. Because he has a strange fascination with dung pies, and it seems like they're made out of his own dung. Valley of Drakes. Thank goodness we got rid of that Blight Town filter and things look just a little bit more cheery. Well, until we find a corpse that has a soul on it. We're using the key to the New Londo Ruins. I'm going to show you where the New Londo Ruins are. We're not going there just yet. But this will help you to understand just how the maps are interconnected the next time we come down to the ruins from a different angle. And the next time that we visit New Londo Ruins, you can actually meet one of the sealers, Ingward. Now I'm taking this left path just to show you that at the end, after you've killed the Four Kings, if you come back here, which we will, you will find Witch Beatrice set. But it will be right about where we were just standing. That's an easy leap to make, no matter how heavy you are. And now you can see something rather foreboding in the distance. And this is our first example of an undead dragon. An undead dragon upper half, I guess I should say. The undead dragons in Dark Souls 1 are split, quite literally. You can find their legs in Lost Isolith. You can find their upper half here in Valley of Drakes. And you can find both their legs and the upper half in the Painted World of Ariamas, although they are no longer connected. But he is guarding some loot that we do want to get. Now this first one is a soul of a proud knight, which you can easily just walk up and get. Now there's two more items to get, and the only one you can get is the one that's on the left, which is a store of straight sword. Very carefully approach this. If you move too much further than where I am right now, he will wake up, and he has a very fast swipe attack that will likely kill you. Of course, depending on your amount of HP and defense. But now we're going to wake him up, because we do want to get that item. We are in it for the loot. And just to show you that you can snipe him from back here, he has absolutely no recourse, but it does take a while. So instead, we're going to get him into an AI loop of this poison breath, and then we're going to go in, do a running R1 attack, and run back. Just like so. Now the key here is to wait until the poison breath is almost gone completely before you run in, 
not so you don't get poison. The poison really isn't all that dangerous. The danger is that if you run too early and he hasn't yet initiated his poison breath, he may do the paw swipe attack instead, which, again, likely to kill you. Go ahead and speed this up to 300% because it can take a little bit of time. And with him down, we get a dragon scale, our second one so far. And now we have the Dragon Crest Shield. Dragon Crest Shield is a 100% physical resistance shield, and it also has some pretty decent fire defense at 85. Although, we're about to pick up another shield in just a few minutes here that actually has a better fire defense. Now I'm switching to the Eagle Shield, and I showed you the stats, and the reason is, even though it's only a 95% physical damage reduction, it has an excellent lightning damage reduction. And if you can see these wyverns coming up, they are wyverns, they only have two legs, not four. They breathe electricity, not fire. So for them, we want to have some good lightning defense so we can actually get up close and personal. Here I am again just showing you that while it's possible to snipe them with a bow from back here, it's going to take a while. And I don't know that we quite have the number of arrows to handle it. So you can see there that I had a pretty minimal HP reduction due to his lightning breath. And that's all thanks to the Eagle Shield. Now these Wyverns have very low poise. Even my one-handed attack is able to stagger him with just two hits. So, if you can get next to them, get two hits off, then you can actually just stagger him, get your shield up, rinse and repeat. And we were fortunate enough to get a Dragon Scale off that Wyvern, and a Humanity out of the cave that he was guarding. Now these are not a very common drop rate. But if you're looking to level up in the path of the Dragon Covenant without doing any sort of PvP, you can theoretically farm these to get all the Dragon Scales you need. There again, the 1-2 combo to stagger. Get your shield up. Now, unfortunately, if you're locked on and you're not far enough back, you can run the risk of actually ending up in front of the electricity attack when you're using your own slashes. We have two down, we still have four to go. Now this one, I definitely want to pull towards me because there are a trio behind him, all of which can be aggroed if you go too far on the bridge. And you can see just how low their poise must be considering I was able to actually stagger him with my arrows. There's the one, two. Also, their tail has a very wonky hitbox. And that usually wouldn't be too much of a big deal, except for the fact that when you're on the bridge, especially fighting this one in particular, if he turns around quickly, you can actually get caught on his tail, and it is not unheard of to be kicked off the bridge due to that hitbox. So something to keep in mind, and a reason why I like to fight him in this open area. And he is just on a troll today. Okay, with him down, we can approach the bridge. We're not going to go to that shiny just yet. We're going to deal with these dragons, but we are going to deal with them in a very safe way. So as I said, if you're far enough away, their aggro range will not kick in, and you can just hit them with arrows, and you're completely safe. However, as you can see, doing 32 even for a critical hit on his head is really going to take a little while. So instead, we're going to use Power Within to increase our damage. And now... Well, we can get 19 on that hit there, but for a critical hit, which we'll get right here, we can do 46 damage. It's still going to take a little while, and I am going to speed this up to 300%. However, with a single cast of Power Within, you have almost enough time in order to take out both of these Wyverns with the stats that we currently have. The one thing to remember is that Power Within is slowly ticking down her health. You can see it in the top left corner. So at some point, it's going to be wise in order to stop and actually heal, which we've just done. Now, Power Within has just run off, but the dragon is nearly dead. So we'll just keep firing a few arrows. And then the last one, don't worry, we're going to take him on head on. All right, there it is, one left. But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and pick up this armor set here. 
which is the Brigand set. So the Brigand set is the starting class for the Bandit class. Now something that I want to talk about while I'm fighting this Wyvern here, because we have a little bit to talk about something, is I love how Dark Souls 1 really tells a story even in death. And by that I mean the corpses tell you something about the person, the individual who died there and left the items. For example, as we've traversed through the Lower Undead Burg, into the depths, through Blight Town, and now into the Valley of Drakes, we have found almost all of the armor sets of the starting classes. We have another one to find in just a few minutes here. But it's interesting to note that if we are truly a chosen undead, but there have been others before us because we do know that Dark Souls, or Souls in general, is cyclical in nature, we have now made it further than most of the other undeads have in the past. So this is something that can actually give you hope as a player that you have actually outlived most of your counterparts. Now it can also be a bit depressing considering most of them have died, but it's just nice to note that the story writers in Dark Souls 1 were so thoughtful and they had so much forethought that the corpses themselves actually tell you a little bit about the world that you're currently living in. But anyway, up at the top of this ladder we get the Red Tear Stone Ring. Now the Red Tear Stone Ring, unlike in Dark Souls 2, is incredible. The Red Tear Stone Ring in Dark Souls 1 gives you a 50% increased damage no matter what weapon or spell you're using, as long as you're under 20% HP. Now the beautiful thing about this is that it also stacks with Power Within. So if you can get your health low enough, cast Power Within to drop below 20%, you can stack both, and now you're in what we like to call Hyper Mode, and your damage is off the charts. It's not actually off the charts, technically. I'm sure there are damage charts that show you exactly what your damage would be. But what I'm trying to get at is the fact that you can become incredibly powerful, but it's a risk-reward system. You are now under 20% HP. Most attacks from even simple enemies are going to be enough to kill you. But for some of those, for some of those people who are interested in the one-shot challenge in Dark Souls 1, this is your go-to build. The hyper mode with the red tier stone ring and power within. Now I wasn't sure if I was going to stop at this bonfire and level up and also kindle it, but I'm glad I did. And that's a bit of foreshadowing for you. Coming out of this cave, make sure that you are ready with your shield because we have our next Black Knight. This one has a halberd. Now we've already mentioned before how every Black Knight can drop their respective weapons, so this one has a chance of dropping the halberd, and all of them have the chance of dropping the shield. In this case, we get the Black Knight Shield. We also get a blue Titanite Chunk, that is a guaranteed drop. And we also get the Grass Crest Shield behind him. Now the Black Knight Shield is the shield I referenced earlier as far as having a higher fire defense than the Dragon Crest Shield. This actually has a 95% fire reduction, which is very, very good. Now here's the Grass Crest Shield at work. You can see that I have an aura as I have that shield equipped. And the reason that there is an aura is that this shield has built-in stamina regeneration, roughly at the rate of 10 stamina units per second. Now this stamina regen also will stack with the Mask of the Child and the Chloranthi Ring. So if you're wearing all three of those, you would be amazed at how fast your stamina regenerates. Entering into this next area, Dark Root Basin. We're going to head up here to this tower. You can see some familiar landscape up in the top there. But this tower, we have actually been inside of before, just in the upper tiers. And unfortunately, this door is going to be locked, but I wanted to show you it again to give you some perspective of the interconnectedness. Behind that door is Havel the Rock. We will be dealing with Havel momentarily, not in this episode, but soon. But in order to get that key, we would need to go into the forest and kill the Moonlight Butterfly. Something that, unfortunately, we won't be undertaking until after the DLC. Get ourselves a large soul of a Nameless Soldier, and now we have our first golems to deal with. 
Now these crystal golems have some good defense, and they also have some good offense. And I'm going to show you another way, although I botch it up horribly, of dealing with them without getting too close. By the way, these golems do have a decent drop rate of blue titanite chunks, so if you're looking to farm those in order to upgrade your magic or enchanted weapons, this is a great spot to do so. Especially if you can get this tactic down, again of which I fail miserably. We have some incoming water attacks that we haven't actually seen the culprit, although you can kind of see him through the trees. But if you can actually get the golems to get into the line of sight of that enemy, you can get them hit with the water attacks, and typically just two is enough to kill each golem. But now, let's go see what's actually causing those water attacks. By the way, I want to show you here, looks like you're safe behind this rock. You're very much not. Even though the water hits and breaks on the opposite side, it does actually continue through and has a large enough hitbox to hit you. But instead, just go ahead and get a good hit in the face, I guess. What I was going to say was get a good shield up and just run straight at this enemy, and this is a Hydra. There are two Hydra in the game. There's one here. I guess that goes without saying. And there's also one in the Great Hollow, or at the bottom of the Great Hollow, which is Ash Lake. But the way this works is he will shoot these water projectiles at you until you get relatively close, and then he'll start just lunging his multiple heads at you. What I recommend doing, get a 100% physical block shield, wait for them to lunge, find the nearest head, switch to two hand, and then just lop off one of the heads. I was a bit slow there because I actually got hit. But the other thing to consider is that there's a reason I'm not getting much closer, and that is the fact that you can kind of see it there. The land that I'm standing on gives away. And unfortunately, you cannot swim in Dark Souls. I guess it's due to your heavy armor. But even if you're naked, you can. So don't try. Or do. Again, not your mother. But if you walk too much further than I am, you will perish. With the two-hand claymore, each head only takes one hit. And there's two ways to kill the Hydra. You can drain his HP bar completely, or you can simply cut off all of his heads. And if you cut off all of his heads, even if he has HP remaining, he will die. Now something happens in this fight that I've actually never seen before. One of the heads begins to troll me and troll me hard, and it's the one there on the far right. So let's go ahead, let's get rid of this one. And now we only have one left, so it should be relatively simple. Except... He's going over to the right, and he's not actually embedding his head in the ground, he's actually kind of skirting the surface of the water, creating a very difficult to hit hitbox. You can see there, I really thought that that running R1 would have done it, but we'll keep trying. Although, as we shift, he keeps shifting, and there again, really thought that was it. Alright. Third time's the charm thought maybe when he was coming back I could get him with the overhand, but not so much. And this is what he keeps doing. I've actually never seen this before, so now I decide how many arrows would it take in order to kill him. And the answer is too many for me to actually do the bow method. So instead, we're going to wait for him to lunge again, give it a good college try, and there's the edge I was talking about. <sighs> So instead of making you watch the golem fights again, as well as cutting off all the individual heads, here we are again with one head left, and he's actually doing the same exact maneuver. He is going off to the left, making it very difficult to hit. Have any of you ever encountered this behavior? I honestly think this is the first time. But again, even though it seems like my running R1s should hit, even though it's just outside of the range of the sword, really having very little luck. And even there, the overhead, really thought that was going to do it. But, rest assured, we are going to kill this Hydra. Uh, maybe not with the jumping R2, but we are going to kill this Hydra. This is everything possible, after all. And there it is. 
So as you can see, he did still have some HP remaining, but he did die, and we're left with the Dragon Scale and the Dust Crown Ring. And I'll talk about the Dust Crown Ring in just a moment, but I want to show you this ladder that does go to the back entrance into the forest. This is the longest ladder in the game, possibly in the history of mankind. It is a misery to climb up. But the Dust Crown Ring, it does belong to Dusk of Ulysseel, someone that we're going to see momentarily. This gives you 50% more spell castings at the cost of 50% HP. So, if you're okay running a glass cannon and you need some more spells, Dust Crown Ring might be the ring for you. Now we're running back here seemingly into nowhere, but what's going to happen is we're going to quit out, and then we come back into our game, there's now a golden crystal golem. And if you look very, very carefully, unfortunately I didn't do any zooming in here, but you can actually see a figure inside of this golem. Let's see if there's a good opportunity. Not really, unfortunately. There, during the jump, you could kind of see it, but there are some images online if you really want to see it. But there's someone trapped inside, and this is actually one of two golems that we're going to find in the game that have someone trapped inside. So as long as you're careful, only attack when you have ample opportunity. Good opportunity is right after he does that ground pound. You can see that someone actually pops out, and this, as her ring would imply, is Dusk of Ulysseel. So, tis thou who rescued It me. is Most I who rescueth so, you. But we're going to say yes because we do want to use her for some miracles. And now she's going to disappear, but we're going to see her again in just a minute. First, we have to run back across this lake. By the way, pay attention to the surroundings of this lake. Even though it's going to look fairly different, we are going to be in this area again, but in a different time period. Hint, hint, Artorius of the Abyss DLC. So running back, we're going to go get this shiny, and you can kind of see something glinting to the right of that rock. We'll go check that out in just a second here. But first, grab the Night Set. So this is the armor of the knight starting class, so yet again another undead who didn't quite make it. But this summon sign disappears as soon as you touch it, because we're not actually summoning someone to assist us with a boss battle, we're summoning Dusk of Ulysseel, so we can access her as a merchant. And so we can also get the proper bow gesture. So she has a few spells that we can buy. We're going to buy Hidden Body and Cast Light, both of which will have very specific uses later on. She also sells the Ulysseel Ivory Catalyst, which to me looks much like the Witch Tree branch in Dark Souls 2. But anyway, the Ulysseel Ivory Catalyst, if you are a sorcerer not looking to level up too much and you have less than 30 intelligence, this has the highest magic attack rating of any catalyst in the game. Again, under 30 intelligence. So with Dusk Root Basin completed, we are going to make our way up, and we're going to end up in an area that you will be familiar with by now, again, just showing you the interconnectedness of all the areas. We do have a few more items to pick up along the way. For example, hop down off this ledge here, and yet another chosen undead who maybe shouldn't have been chosen. This would be the Hunter Armor. The leather armor, gloves, boots, but we also get a longbow and feather arrows. So we now have an upgrade to our short bow, and we have feather arrows, which although the damage is reduced, the feather arrows go much further than standard arrows. As soon as you round that corner, make sure that you have a weapon that can do some sort of overhead swing so you can kill this crystal lizard. The titanite chunk there is guaranteed. The twinkling titanite we got, that was a pleasant surprise. And this is a reason why I like to run with 10 Soft Humanity in my top left corner as much as I can throughout the game. So here we are in Darkroot Garden. We just killed one of the Garden Guardians, or the Garden Servants. And we're going to head back. We're not going to go to the right, which would go further into the forest. But instead, we're going to take a peek into this building and see a rather imposing demon ahead of us. This is our first example of a Titanite demon. 
We're going to see a few of these in the game, and each one is going to drop a Demon Titanite for us, guaranteed. Demon Titanite is used to level up boss weapons that you can get for converting some certain weapons, combining them with boss souls, later on once we get to Anor Lundo. Now, if you're looking to farm Demon Titanite, there is only one of these Titanite demons that respawns, and that's the one in Lost Isolith. And I don't know how much time you want to spend in Lost Isolith. But, tactic for this is, again, if you have a good shield, it makes it so much easier, but you want to stick close to his body. As long as you're close, you can actually have many of his swings avoid you completely, like that one. But with him down, like I said, we're going to get our Demon Titanite, and a very pleasant surprise, we got his weapon, the Titanite Catchpole. Titanite Catchpole only has about a 2% drop rate, so to get one for our very first Titanite Demon is pretty neat. Speaking of pretty neat, this weapon has most of its damage actually coming from magic damage, not physical, but it also has a very unique R2. So here's the R1 combo, but then R2 is this leaping attack. Now, most weapons have a leaping attack if you do forward on the analog stick and R2 at the same time. However, this is not that move. This is purely me pressing my R2 attack in order to do this leaping ground pound. Very cool. But guys, that's going to do it, and you should recognize where we are at this point. And with Andre here, our friendly neighborhood blacksmith, that is going to wrap up episode 5 of Everything Possible in Dark Souls 1. If you guys learned something, please leave me a comment below. If I missed something, make sure you leave that comment as well. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time.